Welcome to the Fennel Shooting Podcast. Fueled by Fioki, the industry standard that champions trust. If you're a clay target shooter, then we have something for you. Speaking with some of the best in the industry about the game you're passionate about. Follow us at the Clay Lab on YouTube and Spotify. The Fennel Podcast is also brought to you by the Clay Lab, Ranger, Kriegoff International, Briley Manufacturing, Long Range, Rainier Shotgun Sports, Mech Outdoors, Greenwood Custom Stocks, Electronic Shooters Protection, and Westside Sporting Grounds. Here's your host, Will Fennel of the Fennel Shooting School. On the line, I've got Mr. Tim Ward, gunsmith to the stars. Uh, he is out of Florida, and thought we'd catch up with Tim. He's had some kind of changes in uh, how he's doing business, and we thought we'd uh, fill everybody in, and we'll talk about a little bit of gun maintenance. What's up, Tim? Well, it's all good. All the all-, all the snowbirds are down in the Florida, starting all the early shoots right now. We're real busy taking care of everybody's guns, getting them all fixed up for a for another sporting clay season. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy how busy Florida gets this time of year. So, everybody, I'm, I got to know Tim through shooting in Kriegoff and working with Kriegoff, and Tim is a is a Kriegoff certified gunsmith. Um, but you know, there's a lot of story to tell. Tim can work on anything, any any of your well, anything. Period. But he specializes in competition shotguns. I think that'd be safe to say, uh, Parazzi's, Berettas. Um, but obviously Creek offs are, are, are a focus. So Tim, um, tell us kind of where you're at and what's going on now. So, uh, I resigned my position with DuPont Creek off after doing work for them for quite a while and, uh, started up my own business again, GTW gunsmithing. And, uh, we live in South Florida, a little bit North Okeechobee and, uh, we're just trying to take care of. Everybody that needs us to keep the guns up and running. Yep. So it's important for everybody to know that you're still doing, you know, Creek off gun servicing and uh, annuals and all that kind of thing. And they can get in touch with you uh, to do that. But also, again, uh, Creek off, I feel like, has done a great job of, of uh, educating the shooting public that, you know, the guns need annual services or preventive maintenance, let's just call it. Uh, you, you do that kind of thing on other brands also, right? Yeah, certainly we do it on Berettas, Parazis, just most of the guns you see out on the circuit that people are putting a high volume uh, of ammunition through. Uh, so tell us a little bit about an annual for Creek Off and then also kind of what they'd look like for other guns. Yeah, so basically, you know, when let's, let's discuss what an annual service really is. And a lot of people uh, sometimes think that they need to get their guns serviced every year, but it's more of a round count. So, yeah. you know, when they ask me how often, you know, do I bring my gun to you every year? And I'll ask them, you know, well, how many rounds are you shooting a year? If they're shooting 5,000 rounds a year, I said, it's probably not necessary. Uh, but if they're shooting 20 or 25,000 rounds a year, then they should, you know, certainly get it looked at every year. And, and what we're trying to do with the annual uh, is we go in there, we totally disassemble everything. We replace all the springs, the firing pins, any consumable parts, you know, and springs wear out eventually and firing pins, you know, get pitted and go bad. But what we're trying to do is prevent a shooter from having a bad experience while he signed up for a shoot. You know, he spent all his money on hotels and ammunition and, and, uh, you know, signing up for the shoot and events and everything. We don't want him in the middle of it and having his gun break down. And then, then we've got an emergency, you know, so we're trying to prevent that. You're staying up late at night trying to get the guy's gun ready for the 8 o'clock rotation. You've seen me do that a time or two. A time or (laughs) 50, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, You know, and I'll I'll add to the – I totally get it. It's a round count thing, twenty to 25,000 round interval. But but I'm honest. I'll tell my students who are serious shooters that are spending money to go to tournaments, but maybe they're not shooting 20,000 rounds a year, I probably wouldn't – I probably wouldn't wait more than two years because unless you're adept at pulling your gun apart and making sure there's no rust starting inside your gun that you didn't know about because you got caught that time shooting in the rain or, you know, dust from some super dusty tournament and and goo getting in there and mixing with your oil. um, 
I, I totally get it that mechanically 20 to 25,000 rounds is the right number. But man, if you're spending money to go off to tournaments and, and you're really dependent on things, I think, I think at least every couple of years, you ought to get a service job done. Call it an annual, call it whatever you will. You know, annual is just kind of the, the term we all use, but I'd get it. I'd get lit Tim uh, or one of the certified gunsmiths out there. You know, if it's Krieg off, um, get him to go through the gun. I, it always is great when Tim hands it back to you and it feels like a new gun. Um, it, it, there's a whole lot to it. Essentially, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you do a, an annual on a gun, on a Krieg off, you've essentially got a new gun mechanically. Correct. Yeah. And, and one of the nice things about the Kriegoff shotguns, they've got engineering incorporated into them now where we can tighten the barrels up. Uh, we can check the overcock to make sure the cocking levers aren't worn out. There's a lot more that goes into it than just, uh, you know, replacing springs and, and firing pins. So, you know, we check out all the tolerances. We make sure the gun doesn't have head space. You know, we check the wood to see if the if the uh, receiver is set back into the wood and relieve it a little bit if it needs to so it, so the stock doesn't crack eventually. Uh, yeah. You know, and a lot of people, when they send their gun in for, a, for an annual service, they'll say, hey, my recoil pad's worn out. Can you put a new one of them on while it's here? You know, or we might re-blue the barrels if they need it, if, you know, if that's what they want. So uh, it's a good time to send it in. And uh, if you have some other little projects you want done, we can address it at the same time. Yeah, the 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 notion that or the the way so many people unfortunately treat their competition gun is they just shoot them until they break. And if you follow that theory, it'll typically break eh, first day of the nationals, or <laughs> you know um, during the U.S. Open or something little like that. You know, so. Um, you know, one of the things I highly value about Krieg Off is they, they're tops in service. And, and at the major shoots, they'll be a Krieg Off certified guns, but they take care of something if something does go wrong. I mean, we break, I've broken all these guns one time or another, somehow or another, they all break. But uh, if you get it, you get an annual service done, it don't happen a whole lot with Krieg Off, that's for sure. What is an annual, um, what you would consider an annual service look like for, say, a uh, uh, you know, a Parazzi or a DT-11, same kind of thing. I mean, those guns, well, like 11 runs on flat springs, so instead of coil springs, but you still kind of check firing pins and, and all that kind of stuff? Or? Yeah, we do the same thing. And even, you know, some of the Parazzi's Prazi, got a coil spring model and a flat spring model as well. And it's always a good idea to uh, to replace those hammer springs and keep an extra, you know, they, they sell you a spare set of uh, firing pins and hammer springs with a new Parazzi. So you've got spares and they're relatively easy to change. So you've got some backup parts there, but, but, uh, and you know, even though you don't break a firing pin necessarily, uh, some of the ammunition that's out there now has primers that pierce really easy. Yep. And when the primers pierce, those gases shoot through the little hole in the primer and they start eroding the face of your firing pin. And they get shorter yeah. and shorter until they stop working. So, uh, I uh, I was giving a lesson the other day to a good student, and we were shooting at about dust dark into the lesson, and I started seeing sparks come out around yeah. the back of the receiver, and I'm like, whoa, something's not good. So I started looking at it. She was getting pierced primers, uh, and it was shooting all that hot gas back into the back of the receiver, and then some of it was escaping around the the fit of the wood to the to the receiver. And, um, yeah, took, took the barrels off, ex- you know, extended the firing pins and you could just see the bottom barrel was just like, you know, just all beat up and pitted. Yeah. And, and I started looking through the trash bucket and yeah, there was shell after shell after shell with black soot all in the primer hole. So, uh, that's a no joke thing to keep an eye on because yeah, you can replace the firing pins or it'll still shoot. That's what people tell me all the time. Well, it's still shooting. I'm not worried about it. Uh, we pull that stock off, and it looks like you've had a barbecue inside the gun. Yeah, and eventually it blows a lot of carbon through that little hole. And yeah. It's also something that uh, you, you sort of want to keep an eye out for. If you start seeing those little black rings around your breech face, that means you're, you're piercing primers now and again. And uh, like on a Kriegoff, they make th- the Kriegoff has a two-piece firing pin system. So they have a front firing pin and a rear firing pin. That's why you'll never break one. But they also make three different lengths of rear firing pins. So if we have a gun that comes in 
and we see that the firing pins are pitted really bad, then we can go to the next size shorter firing pin so it gives it a little less firing pin protrusion and to try to prevent the, uh, the primer piercing. And it has nothing to do with the... Uh, with any of the guns, it's just, you know, some of the ammunition out there has has uh, really bad primers in it that pierce really easy. But I see it on Brownings, Berettas, Perazzi's, you know, all, all the different brand guns that are out there, you know, you see the same issues. It's more of an ammunition problem than it is a gun problem. Yeah, and it, it seems like it's kind of, kind of a tolerant stack thing. Like I'll see somebody shooting brand X ammo not having any problems. Then I see right. another person shooting the same ammo, different gun, and they're getting Pierce primers. Right. So is it, it I, I've, I've always thought, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's, it's, yes, some primers are harder, more prone to this than others, but it can be controlled with how far out the firing pin sticks? Correct. Okay. Yes. And then some primers are just more forgiving. Yeah. Some brands yeah. ammo. Okay. Yeah, they're not. All right. Um. Is there anything – okay, this this is good. We just kind of went into something that the shooter can tell if he's got a problem. Is there any other things that you, know, you want to share with people to keep an eye on, like, uh, you know, stock getting loose. I, mean, I had somebody with a crack stock the other day on uh, a really high-end Parazzi, and the stock bolt was loose about three turns. And he'd been, you know, shooting and shooting and slamming his gun closed, and stock bolt's loose, cracks the stock in half. So what are some other things shooters could do preventive maintenance-wise or keep an eye out to tell their gunsmith when there's a problem? Well, one thing I see quite a bit, and it's something that you'll notice immediately, and that's when you just kind of need to stop, is if if you feel your gun, it doesn't matter what brand it is. If you feel your gun when you're opening, it feels real gritty, then just stop and wipe everything down, put some new grease on there, and then you could so pull the barrels time. off if it's an yeah, open pull, the barrels, pull barrels off. barrels off. A lot of times, you know, when you have grease on the bearing surfaces, you know, on the sides of your monoblock on the barrels and that sort of thing, and in between your fore end iron and the, and the receiver face, you know, sometimes that grease will pick up a little, you know, little piece of grit or something that gets ground yeah. in there. And once yeah. that metal starts galling, then it just starts really tearing things up in there. So if you start feeling that, because the gun should open nice and smooth, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and close that, smooth. If you feel that galling, then you you need to stop and whatever little piece of sand or, or rock or whatever got in there, get it out. Because once that metal starts galling, then it starts galling on itself. Right. And, and then you've got big, ugly scratches on your monoblock and that sort of thing. Uh, like I say, if you start feeling like your fore end's loose, you know, then it's time to tighten it up. Because if those screws start to get loose, then under recoil, you know, if things are moving around, it'll shear the screws off. Mm-hmm. Or uh, or split the wood. Yeah, uh, the the, butt, the butt stocks being loose is a big one. You know, that'll cause the stock to crack. It'll also, in some cases, cause the guns to start doubling. So, uh, you know, just whenever something seems out of normal, then it's time to take a look or give me a call. Yeah, I can say, you know, here's what you need to look at. Yeah, I mean, I think I think just all too often shooters just they buy a quality gun and they think, okay, this thing, I paid a lot of money. It's just going to run forever. Well, you know, you can buy a Porsche and if you don't ever change the oil, you're going to have a problem. So uh, um, you got to do a little bit of preventive maintenance and people, I think obsess sometimes about the wrong things. Like they're just constantly cleaning out the inside of the barrels and think that's taking care of their gun. Well, yeah, it's important that you clean the inside of the barrel out every now and then and, uh, you know, make sure it doesn't rust inside there. If it's a Beretta or something with chrome line boards, then you can even be a little lazy about it because it's not going to rust inside. But you know that where the where the where the barrels pivot in the action is a lot more important than the inside of your barrel. Yeah, something else that that brings to mind is, uh, and I see it all the time, especially if the gun has thin wall chokes in them. Take your Ooh. chokes out often and oil them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It, you should with any choke. But with thin walls, especially because the tolerances are so tight, um, it doesn't take a whole lot for one of those to seize in there, does it? No. And, you know, then we got to get out a propane torch and, you know, it's kind of painstaking to get them out. But especially painful, with thin wall chokes. Painful to watch is what yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the the little teeth or the little grooves in the, in the choke tube for screwing them in and out, 
they're real small as well. So once you peel those off, you know, then you really got a problem. And, yep. And, Hooray uh, for fixed chokes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, at a shoot, it's not the most opportune time to get stuck chokes out. You know, absolutely do it. But, absolutely. But, uh, you know, if you just take them out, you know, when just do it when you clean your barrel. If you clean your barrel every time after you get done shooting, just screw your chokes out, wipe them off, put a little oil on them, especially if you've been shooting in the rain. Yep. And uh, you'll never have a problem. What do you recommend somebody do with an over and under if they get caught in a tournament in the rain? Well, what I recommend they do is when they get back to the hotel or wherever they're staying, back to their camper, you know, get the wood off and spray it out with air real good and spray some oil in there. Uh, wipe the oil off the sides of the receiver, but then put the wood back on. You don't want to. You don't want to have a wet piece of wood laying on the table and go to put it on the next morning, and then it's warped or something. So, you know, get get the wood off the gun, blow it out with air, uh, spray some oil in there. You know, get out, get all the places where the water got in between the wood and the metal cleaned up, and then you know wipe the stock out good because you'll see a bunch of moisture in the stock. Don't and, uh, don't put any heat on the wood though, right? No, no. Yeah, just just kind of wipe it out. Good. Air dry with a towel or something and then you know within an hour or two make sure it gets back on the gun just don't let it sit overnight if it's really soaked and uh, maybe don't put it on all the way tight at first or would you go ahead and tighten no, it up I'd, I'd snug it up I'd say, yeah okay. not tight tight but just snug it up a little bit something else uh when you're shooting in the rain that, that i see is a lot of times you get water between the flats of the barrel and the top of the receiver mm-hmm and that kind of causes a hydraulic push when you shoot because mm-hmm. you can't compress water. Yeah. So, you know, I have, if people are shooting and it's raining real hard and they'll come in and say, my gun's coming open, it's opening all the time on me. When I shoot my second shot, you know, the barrels come open. If you start experiencing that, take a Q-tip or something and just clean the water out between the barrel and the receiver where it's where the flats sit down and then that'll, that'll stop. Yeah. And, and tell me if this is wrong, but I've always thought, it's raining real hard. Um, I try to keep my action closed as much as I can. Yeah, yes, there's good, safety yeah. times where we got to break the gun open. I get that. But try to keep water from flowing into that action. Yeah, I mean, you can only um, do what you can do. But yep. But if you can keep a towel wrapped around it when you're not shooting it and, you know, try to keep yep. the receiver closed in the rain, that's better. Yep, good. Um, any other any other peculiarities from one brand and other things to look out for if you're shooting brand X or brand Y or Well, you know, most of the guns that we deal with are manufactured to shoot a high volume amount of ammunition, you know. So uh and there's great quality guns out there. You know, Kriegoffs, you know, people ask me, they say, I I know you're a Kriegoff guy, but those guns really last as long as they say. And I said, you go to a skeet shoot in the Southeast and you'll see these 90 year old men drag around these K32s. They're still shooting them 10,000 rounds a year and they haven't made one in 50 years. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and the K32 isn't near the gun the K80 was, but, right. but, uh, but yeah, the Parazis, the Kriegoffs, the Berettas, they're all, you know, a great quality gun that's, that's designed, you know, when you get into like the DT, uh, uh, Berettas, uh, the 686s. If a guy's looking for an entry level gun, that gun was designed to be rebuilt. To yeah. make oversized locking lugs, oversized hinge pins, oversized everything. Uh, and you know, very, very easy to get parts for. So if a guy's just wanting to dip his toes into the sporting clays or the competitive shotgun uh, world, he doesn't really know if he's going to like it. He doesn't want to go out and spend ten thousand plus dollars on a shotgun. You know, that that's a good gun to get into. To, to try it out. Yeah, that's, that's probably the gun I recommend most often to somebody who's you know, like in their war first lesson or two. And they're like, okay, I want to, you know, I've, I've been shooting my Dove gun and I want them ready to buy my first sporting clay gun. Um, Breda 686 sporting is kind of hard to beat for the money. I mean, there's, I don't think that you get a better gun until you get two or three times the price of that. Exactly. And, uh, um, or Bred yeah. automatic, you know. Right. Well, yeah, a lot of people shoot the heck out of those A400s and, you mm-hmm. know, they stand the 391s or 390s or 303s. I mean, it, those things right. still run. You just put fresh springs in them and keep going. Yep. Um, anything else about, you know, is there a, for you, 
Is there a better time of year for somebody to send their gun in? When's, when's a slower time for you? When would the turnaround time be faster if somebody that you know wanted to get a gun serviced by Tim well, Ward? When's a when's a good time of year to do it? Leslie's sitting here out of camera shot and she's giggling right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Miss Leslie. Yeah, probably, probably the slower time of the year would be, you know, between nationals and, and the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, that's about what I thought you'd say, you know, because, you know, right now it's, you know, it's full blown sporting clays, you know, and all the snowbirds are down here over at the dollar shooting trap and this and that. But, uh, but, you know, as we get into the spring, then the ski circuit starts up, you know, right. and then as you get into the summer, it's all, you know, trap shooting and, you know, uh, after the grand American in August and the trap shooters, you know, that's kind of the end of their year. And then, you know, of course the world skeet is kind of the last big skeet shoot of the year, which is a couple of weeks before nationals. Uh, and then, and then nationals. So it, when nationals is over, then the, uh, you know, weekly competitions are, are settled down a little bit and that's a good time. It gives me a little more time to be able to work on it. Cause right now we're trying to turn things in, you know, less than a week. Right. Where, you know, because they need them because there's another tournament right coming right around the corner. So, so, uh, you know, and that, that gets back into the preventative maintenance. You know, if you maintain the gun and do some preventative maintenance, you could go the whole year without having to need anything. You know? Right. But if we're to shoot or something, you know, we're always booked solid on on doing services and that sort of thing, so that people can save the shipping and that kind of stuff too. So, so yeah. Speaking of that, it's because I think there've been some kind of changes, and I haven't kept up on it as well as I should have. Um, when somebody, you know, out of state or whatever, wants to get their gun work on, and they're going to send it to Tim Ward um, and Miss Leslie to get it fixed or get it serviced, what is the regulations now on shipping the gun? Well. As far as the government regulations, they really haven't changed. Right. But the uh, the protocols that the specific shipping companies use, uh, they're, they're kind of making their own rules. So what we've found uh, lately, if you take your gun to a UPS store, mm-hmm. they typically won't accept it. Okay. They tell them okay. they ship guns. So you used to just have to take it to the regular hub, and then there wasn't a problem if you just tell them you're sending it in for repair. Uh, but now UPS requires a copy of, of my FFL that they can keep on file. And typically the easiest way for it to go is when you call, uh, get your gun boxed up, give Leslie the dimensions of the box and the weight, and then she will generate you a prepaid shipping label. And if we generate the label, oh. then they don't give you any trouble at all. Oh, perfect. So yeah. basically, just, because you're the FFL, you ship it. It's like, so like sending a call tag. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then we so just, okay. Don't, don't worry, Leslie. We're going to put all your contact info. Um, it will all be in this. So you'll have email and a uh, phone number. Um, Tim, you don't have a website right now, do you? No. Okay. Uh, you'd probably have too much business if you had a website. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know something else, getting back to the UPS label stuff. If you, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we're able to, to uh, in most cases, turn this stuff around so quickly is if Leslie's aware that it's coming, like if she's mm-hmm. generating a label for you, then she knows the job's coming and she'll ask you, you know, what is, what needs done? You say, well, I need an annual on my gun or the stock's broken or whatever the case may be. Then she goes ahead and pre-schedules that on my schedule. So before the gun even arrives, we've already got it on my schedule to work on. Yep. You know so, that Tuesday you're doing Will Fennell's K80 yeah. parkour and it needs yeah, an like annual people, and a they, new recoil they, pad. Yeah. They call me and ask me when I have time to do something. And I say, you better tell, ask Leslie because I just get up in the morning and do what I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> it's life's, life's better that way, too. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, so if we, if we know that the gun's coming and what needs to be done, I'll tell Leslie I need two hours for that job. She'll get it on my on my schedule. And then we can tell them, okay, it's going to show up on, on Friday. But see, we know this a week in advance now. Yeah. So then, you know, the day it shows up or the next day, she's got it on my schedule and turn it around pretty quickly and get it right out. So with Leslie's assistance, it's not too scary 
for your average uh, shooter to send his gun down to see y'all. She's going to help the she's going to help the shooter through the pop process of getting this gun down there. Yeah, and I'd like to mention one more thing. You're going to kind of giggle when I tell you, but it happens more often than you would think. Uh, a lot of times we'll get a gun in and we unbox it and the case is locked. <laughs> and the note with the combination, you know, because those little dials will turn in shipping sometimes. Right. So, you know, if it's not zero, 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 then we don't have any idea what it is. So uh, write, the, write the case combo you know, stick it on the case on a post-it note or something, tape it to it, you know, so when we get the gun, especially if there is a note inside the case, because we'll get a phone call sometimes says, how you coming on my gun? What's your name? You know, Bob Smith. I'll say, hmm, is it in a Negrini case? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what's the combination? We can't even get into it. We didn't know, you know, who, know who it belonged to. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, I imagine people, guns just show up with no note in them at all, like you're supposed to. Yeah, know and, that it's you know. Yeah, that's gun. that's really frustrating. Always put a note in because even though you say, well, you know, Leslie will say, what are we supposed to do with your gun when she goes to log it in? She says, well, I talked to Tim about it. She's like, well, he can't remember all that. He talks on people all the time. Yeah. You know? So, you know, make sure you put a note in there so everything gets addressed. And yeah, and that I way, put, when I'm I finished had, with the gun. Yeah, I go through I, the note and I mark everything off. Okay, did yeah. this? Did this? Did this? Did this? I addressed it all. You know, if nothing else, put a luggage tag on the case that's got your name and phone number on it. Right. Or piece of tape on the case and write your name and phone number on it. So if they can't get in, at least Leslie has a name and a phone number to call and say, what's your damn combination? So, exactly. Yep. Make all this easy and just get your gun serviced and take care of it. Yep. Yep. Cool, man. Well, I will be down to Florida soon. Look forward to seeing you down there. Can't wait. Yeah. Weather's good, isn't it? It's good now, yeah. It's yeah, just it's, right. It's, this time of the year is perfect. Yeah, it's uh, it's still a little chilly up here in South Carolina. Not bad, but a little chilly. Not as bad as it was. All right, gang. We'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Enjoy talking to you, Tim. Um, let's do this. Let's do this every so often, if you don't mind. I, I'll come up with some more gun issues to talk about, and we'll uh, we'll keep the shooting public apprised to what's going on. How about that? Sounds like a good plan. All right, buddy. Uh, I'm going to log us off now and look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. All right, my friend. You have a good one. All right, buddy. Take care. You bet. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Remember to subscribe on YouTube and Spotify to The Clay Lab. That way you never miss an episode. We'll catch you here next time on The Fennel Podcast. <laughs>